Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Three Ways Librarians Can Combat Censorship, with Courtney Kincaid, Adrian Lim, and Molly Detman. My name is Jemina Steinfeld, and I'm the Deputy Editor of Index on Censorship Magazine. For those who are unfamiliar with Index on Censorship Magazine, we're a quarterly magazine themed around free expression. The first issue of Index on Censorship appeared in 1972. Since then, some of the greatest names in literature and academia have written for the magazine, including Samuel Beckett, Arthur Miller and Margaret Atwood. The magazine continues to attract great writers, passionate arguments and expose chilling stories of censorship and violence. It's part of a wider organisation which is a non-profit that campaigns for and defends free expression worldwide. On top of publishing work by censored writers and artists, the organisation promotes debate, hosts events and monitors threats to free speech. It's brilliant to be here today talking to three amazing women and as part of an event for Banned Book Suite that's been organised by SAFE. Um, let me begin by introducing our speakers. Courtney Kincaid has been at North Richmond Hills Library as Assistant Direct Library Director for four years. Previously, she was the Children and Young Adult Librarian Assistant Director for two and a half years at Hood County Library, then was the Library Director there for five years in Texas, where she successfully fought a 21-week censorship battle. She received the 2015 I Love My Librarian Award and the 2016 NCTE Honorable Mention for the National Intellectual Freedom Award. Molly Detman is a librarian at Norman North High School in Norman, Oklahoma. This is her second year as a school librarian, having previously worked as a public librarian in teen services for four years. She was also, has also served on the Oklahoma Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Committee for the past three years. Her favorite band book is The Chocolate Wall by Robert Cormier. And finally, Adrian Lim is the Dean of Libraries at the University of Maryland College Park. Prior to joining the University of Maryland in August 2019, Lim was the Dean of Libraries and Philip H. Knight Chair at the University of Oregon. Lim earned her PhD in Library and Information Science at Simmons University in Boston. She has published numerous articles and book chapters and currently serves on the Board of the Association of Research Libraries and the Center for Research Libraries. Just a little bit of kind of housekeeping before we go properly into these conversation. This is a one hour seminar, seminar and it will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We'll be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we'll have time for a Q&A, so get your, um, your questions ready. Please also use the Q&A box to ask questions to speakers throughout the webinar, and then we'll come to them when we open it up. Please also note that the webinar has a hashtag. It is Sage Talks. Feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. Without further ado, let's begin. So Courtney, I wanna, I wanna start with you first. I've read that more than 50 residents signed challenge forms aiming to get my princess boy and this day in June off the shelves when you were a librarian several years ago at, this, at the library that I think was in Texas. Residents complained that this day in June promoted perversion and the gay lifestyle, and they, um, they registered similar complaints about my princess boy. I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about what tactics people employed on top of the 50 challenge, 50 plus challenge forms to get these, to stop these books from circulating and, you know, how personal these challenges went. Yes, it was uh, 52 requests that were turned in and um, it was a 21 week and five days, but who was counting censorship battle? Um, it began, the request for reconsideration forms were turned in, in ironically on June 1st, Gay Pride Month. And um, then after they fought those, it went into policies. And so October, it finally ended. Um, the harassment was unending. Um, they would have, the Tea Party would have meetings at houses and divvy up who was going to stalk and harass the library, who was going to follow me when I went out to lunch or ran errands. Um, and I had 37 churches speak out against me. I had, um, there was someone that would come in and block the entryway for staff when we would come in and we would have to ask them to please move so we can get into the library. 
He would also sit and watch the circulation desk and call and report in what he saw us or he heard us saying. Um, I had a senator and his wife also harass, be involved in the harassment. Um, the senator and his wife had open records requests turned in on me. I had, I think about 13 open record requests from different people. Um, I served on many boards in Granbury. I served as the secretary and leadership Granbury and I was on a um, ag council board. I had to leave those because the people on those boards were submitting requests for reconsideration forms. So it was a little strange to still serve on those boards. So I left. Um, during the almost four hour court hearing, a lady behind me kept kicking my seat, calling me stupid and other names throughout the whole hearing. Um, I couldn't go out to eat for lunch because I didn't know who would spit my food or worse. Um, so I would always eat my office. And um, it was, it not only ended when I left, once they found out when I got a new job where I was, they found that local tea party and did a big presentation and blasted my big picture up on the on the screen and they all came to the, my current library to see if we had the same books and to look for me. Um, so it, it continued, it you know still continues today. I'm talked about anytime Hood County has any kind of issues going on. It's, um, they re always recall me and what I've done. I, I was called transgender person in the library and I, they told me that, or they told others that they, sh I showed child pornography films in the children's area. Um, so it was ongoing harassment. I mean, that sounds absolutely horrendous. Did you have any idea when you got those books that they were going to be that controversial? Uh, not at all. Not at all. We have because other they're books. Just, they're just kids' books, right? They're just right. Same to... Yeah. Um, we had in Tango Makes Three, we had the Red Crayon book um, that only wrote in blue, I think it was. Um, and so they would check anything out that they could see that they thought was LGBT related and they would check it out where others couldn't check them out anymore. And they would kind of hold them hostage um, and then pass them around to different churches. And the commissioners were kind of cornered when they went to their churches asking what are they gonna do? And um, I really wish the commissioner's court would have shut it down early because it's continued on today into it's, I'm just glad I'm not there anymore. It's, they became um, one of the, I think the vice president of the Tea Party at the time became commissioner's court member. Uh, he won by four votes. So I knew they would get on as my bosses and I knew I had to leave and that's what happened. They're all, they're the commissioner's court members, they're library board members now. The mother that started it, she got on the library board and it's just continued, it hasn't slowed down there at all. And do you think that this was more than just about the books? This was about kind of controlling information and speech in a much bigger way at a time that maybe people were worrying about issues. And it just feels like this, surely all these people who were, became involved in this vitriol and this action to get these books banned, surely not all of them really cared about these actual books. They cared about their agenda and their agenda only, and their agenda is anti-LGBT. Um, this was unfortunately at the same time as the county clerk in, in the county, Katie Lang, refused to sign uh, for marriage licenses. So we were in the news on both fronts um, and she was pushing her agenda and she was involved at the Tea Party as well. And so it was a battle for that county all over the news the entire time. So it, that only exacerbated it to where it was just pushed further and further. At the same time, Looks like Jemima temporarily disappeared. Um, Courtney, do you want to continue to touch on the subject while we're sure. with you? 
Um, we can go through my slides if that would be good. Um, yeah. Right now you're seeing the timeline of events. So um, May 15th is when the book was first asked to be moved um, out of the collection and the formal request for reconsiderations didn't get submitted until June 1st. Um, there was a hearing after the books, book stayed, there was a hearing about um, the policies because we were also, previous library director didn't get our policies passed by the court members. She got them passed through the advisory board, which is oh. a governing board. There she is. Hello, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just going through my slides, so it's fine. Um, and so the court members suggested that the Tea Party have uh, be involved in creating our policies and editing them as they want. And so they tried that. Um, and so they were finally passed on October 13th. And next slide. Okay, so I'm a very, everything has to be organized type of person. And the stress of dealing with 21 weeks of this just was too much many times. And so um, you're, when you're going through a challenge like this, you, you have a lot of research you do, a lot of um, circulation reports that you pull, things like that. And so I just shut my door one day and sat down and organized this massive, massive tomb of knowledge. Um, I was always sent little things that would kind of keep me inspired. So you'll see the, all the band book stickers on the side there. Someone sent me The Man in the Arena poem by um, Teddy Roosevelt and the, off, the poet um, that wrote um, Amy Ludwig Vanderwater. She also sent me um, little poems. Are you there? God and warning and a couple of others. So that was nice. I kind of decorated it as my my vision board, if you will. <laughs> and inside, um, I had all of the library advisory board meeting information, the challenge books, any emails that I got, all the requests for reconsideration, which two actually said to burn the books, um, all the open records requests, any PR that I came across, and um, challenge research like the um, the PICO cases and things like that just so I could read through them and the legal opinions through our county attorney. So organize yourself and be ready for snippets of information, anything that you can give, newspapers or news sources, um, facts, facts only, those kinds of things. It's good to get it organized and, and just prepare. Okay, next slide. Um, the picture on the left is a picture of what I walked into in the court hearing. Um, the people that were against the LGBT picture books were all in one corner in a big circle of prayer. Um, and then you had people with signs with, you know, anti-reading, the no reading little sign and don't brainwash children. And the picture on the right is how full our, our tiny little courtroom was. Um, so we had, I don't know how many people, over 200 people, and I think there were at least six news sources that were there um, during it. So almost four hours. And I think that's all on my slides. Mami, did you have more questions? Well, yeah, I think you, you were answering actually some of them in your slides. Like I was really interested by who stood by you and how you kind of, how you kept on going when, you know, by from what you've described, you're in this town where you say people are going to spit in your food. Mm -hmm. But you've obviously um, had have... a lot of support from people who you didn't know. And did it, were there still plenty of people in the community who stood by you? Yes. Um... We had more people for the library. It was like about three to one in both the library advisory board meeting and the court um, meeting. So we had more supporters than they did, but it was, you know, that squeaky wheel thing. Um, they were more vocal. Um, it's it's hard being in, in a Texas county, a very, very conservative county. I mean, I don't know the percentage, but it was 
it was way more conservative um, than liberal in, in that area, which shouldn't matter, but it does in this county. Um, it, it's, um, people are just scared to speak out in this county for um, groups that are not as inclusive as they should be in counties like this. Um, I had supporters and they all got um, band books has a black shirt. It says I'm with the band and then it lists some of the classic band books on the back. Well, they kind of added to it and added Cheryl Keeler Davis's and Gail Pittman's book to the bottom of the list. So they, you know, they would support those. And so they were in the policies court hearing, they were supporting me with those shirts on in the back. Um, you know, they try, they try to be supportive. We, we did get the books stay on the shelves. We did get the books, the policies passed and they, they try to be supportive, but it's, it's hard when it, you're beat down a lot in, in a very um, Tea Party ran town like that. Um, and so one by, by one, I think they're, they're leaving that area, which is sad. Um, a funny little side note, um, my husband's family helped build that library when it first started. And um, right when I left his distance, his distant relatives donated almost a million dollars to expand that library. And so it was hurtful to leave because that's kind of, it was a family building. It was a family library. So I hated to leave, but it was the best decision for me. And um, you say you've obviously left. You, the books are still on the shelves there. What do you think is the kind of the impact of things like this to the local community? Do you think that even though you won, it's the ultimately free speech kind of lost? Or do you think, like, wh which way around would you say it is, if it could be? I mean, it's probably deeply nuanced. I think, well, it's, it's good that the book stayed and the policies passed, but I think the community lost in the end anyway, because it's become so divisive it's it's torn the town apart between the books and um, the county clerk issue, uh, not signing marriage licenses. Um, it's totally divided the county, um, and there's there's more on the conservative end than the liberal end, and so it's it's hurtful that they can't all come together and just see that this isn't a book. Uh, this isn't a book making children gay um which is what they always said this this is um this is not a hidden agenda and i just wish that there was something that could be done for everyone to just to kind of get together and and find a middle ground and and i did i tried to find a middle ground and i talked to gail Pittman, the author of this day in june and i said you know the senator and his wife are coming at me and i'm, I'm trying to really find some middle ground to kind of heal this community and i'm the only thing I can find is in the back of Gail's book, there's you know a timeline of events, uh, dictionary of terms, stories about what this day in June really means. And so I told her, I said, I'm thinking maybe this could be in our adult collection in the nonfiction area because it's it could be a teaching tool. We don't have anything like this in the adult area. I said, would you give your blessing uh, if, if I were to move your book book to, I know all the censorship, anti-censorship people are like, ah, oh, <laughs> that's hard. Um, it was a hard thing to ask because I didn't really approve it, but no one else was living that life like I was. It was tough. Um, and she said, it's not ideal. She would want her book in the children's picture book collection, but she's not there in, in the weeds like I was. And so she said she would support me whatever I would choose. And so with that, I tried to find that middle ground and moved her book to the adult nonfiction, and that didn't help. That wasn't, they didn't see that as, you know, an olive branch. Um, and so in hindsight, I would say don't try to find that middle ground. I'm still upset today that I did that. Um, it would seem like the, a good idea at the time, uh, but it, in the end, it wasn't. It didn't help anything. And to this day, I still want to sneak in there and take it back and put it in the children's picture book collection but but it is what it is and um i have to live with that and that's fine i, I do still struggle with that though 
I'm gonna, that's, thanks so much for sharing this experience because I know that it was a really difficult time for you, still is, as you say. So we really appreciate you coming here and talking about it. Um, I wanna now move on um, to Adrian and just for the people listening from the audience, we, you please do send in questions if you have them. We will have questions towards the end. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna now chat to Adrian who has an, in many ways equally chilling experience the but the kind of comes from a very different group of people and process so adrian could you just tell us a little bit about the night mural vandalism that happened uh yes hi um first of all before i launch into that could i just say courtney thank you so much for being so brave and courageous and i want to torture yourself one more moment about when that incident when people come with the torches and pitchforks and so forth uh, none of us have been in those shoes and i don't know how that we would have reacted um I, I really as someone who's out and proud as a lesbian i understand um some of the hatred against us and they really that those groups really don't want literature to humanize us and to cause empathy for us and so the stance you took was very brave. Thank you so much for being someone to be a hero for our community. Uh, well, yes. now regarding, regarding the University of Oregon, uh, which is the incident that you're talking about, it was my former institution. And we, uh, in our main historic library, there are several murals that were part of the original building of the library, which is a uh, registered as a national historic place. And these are WPA era uh, murals. And they were offensive to many because of a statement on one of them related to, it's just a phrase that's on it, but it became a flashpoint uh, related to Oregon's quote, racial heritage, end quote. And then also these very large murals depicted what some perceived to be a white male supremacist narrative about the development of civilization uh, on the murals. And I think you can see them on the slide. Um, they're very big. I would say they span, you know, two stories in the, in the uh, one of the hallways of the building. Well, several protesters insisted that the library should work to either shroud the murals or destroy them. Uh, and destroying them. Some said even, well, just move them, but they really are embedded into the walls in such a way that I was assured by many conservators that moving them would destroy them. And although I was offended too by the ideologies that they represented, I was also very much against going down the road of shrouding or destroying these artworks, which were unfortunately commissioned for the original historic library when it was built. But even before the protests began and I started my job there in late 2014, I had been working with library colleagues, with students, with faculty to try to engage people in a, a dialogue about cultural contestation, about the importance of informational justice and social justice, even as we address the history and meaning behind the murals. Uh, for example, you know, among other efforts, we held exhibits and forums about it and held workshops. Uh, we commissioned a cross-campus art project where we um, did a call for proposals and artwork for students and faculty to help our community develop countervailing artworks and responses to the murals. Um, despite these efforts, however, a lone protester defaced one of the murals with red paint the person also posted a handmade sign on the wall that asked, what art do you choose to conserve now? And members of our community reacted in ways covering the whole spectrum. Uh, some really vociferously disagreed with what happened and were shocked by it. And then others agreed with the defacement and called it a free speech. The defacement, they called the defacement actually free speech and uh, admonished us that we should leave the defacement in place. Uh, my reaction was to consult our policies or guidance because we did have policies about these types of actions in our library. 
we, we also had act uh, policies about putting signs up throughout the library, which we did not allow, to be honest. And I wanted to reinforce my own commitment to library values. So I began talking with my library colleagues about this. Again, it, we, even within the library, there was a spectrum of responses. Um, but I uh, tried to advocate and then led the repair of the mural. I made sure that the handmade sign was placed into our university archives as part of the institution's history. And then I started posting public statements about why I disagreed with the defacement. Um, related to what Courtney shared with you, uh, earlier in my life, I, when I was a newer librarian, I was involved in a major exhibit, and, and I talked about this in some of my public statements about the defacement, uh, where I, was, uh, uh, I had curated a major exhibit uh, on lesbian pulp fiction at Wayne State University, and this was in the mid to late um, 19, the 90s. And after the exhibit opened, somebody vandalized the works. They painted um, slurs across the artifacts that we had on exhibit, and then they damaged a few of the panels. And my point for sharing that story was to illustrate why I was convinced that condoning acts of vandalism on historic artifacts, admittedly those with, with which we are offended, I felt that they will ultimately and more deeply affect those of us in the minority. And this experience and many other incidents I can relate, including demands uh, from individuals to remove what they deem to be offensive books and materials, inform my own reactions to this incident of vandalism. So that was, the, it, you know, it, it's not even one tenth of what it sounds like Courtney went through, uh, but I feel that it did lead to many important dialogues that we had at, across the campus. And eventually it led to us and the libraries being asked to lead a campus-wide initiative to look at the uh, campus art and monuments and recommend ways that we could be more inclusive uh, of all the diverse uh, population on our campus at the time. So even though it was a bit of a struggle, I think that being open, open and honest and sharing all these perspectives actually is causing us to do a lot more good work there than we had done in the past. Do you think that, I mean, that's, that's, thanks for sharing, and that's really, really good that you feel there's kind of some positivity that's coming out of it. Do you think at the same time, the idea of the library itself is being kind of slightly eroded that, you know, when I was at college, the library was a place where you went to unlock what the knowledge of the world both past and present. So, for example, when I was studying Nazi Germany, I would go to the library and I would get Mein Kampf. That's not because I agreed with what was in Mein Kampf, but that's because it's an important historical resource. And, you know, it seems that we're kind of in this era where people want to pick and choose according to what the current values are. But, like, where does that lead libraries? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a danger, I feel. Um, as someone who was an activist back in, in, in my earlier life, I, I tend to always engage in the dialogue from the standpoint of that I understand, I understand where some groups are coming from when they feel that some other perspectives are trying to eliminate their own existence. You know, that's the argument on some, from some corners is that is it free speech when it acts, or is it some form of hate speech or speech that is trying to um, advance an ideology that makes me less than human. Um, so I do understand the passion, but again, my, my take on it is to always emphasize that if we go down that road, those with less power will definitely be the ones with the most negative impact. So again, acknowledging that there could be some valid points to these calls to remove uh, some of these, uh, you know, when I say valid points, valid points to that feeling that somehow this is an equal uh, voice. You know, in other words, when somebody said to me, um, but Adrian, uh, 
the artwork is embedded in the walls. Uh, is that the same as a library now trying to contextualize? And so uh, while I can understand that, my answer back is, but until we have free and open libraries with access to all of these perspectives, we won't be able to keep having this dialogue even. So I, I, do, I do agree with you that if we lose our library values with regard to intellectual freedom, I am really um, alarmed and not very sure how that would turn out because I, again, I think those with less power, their voices will be oppressed even more than they are now. And you work predominantly in university libraries, so quite different libraries to what Courtney and Molly work in. Um, you, we chart at Index a lot of universities that are doing no platforming, um, usually coming from people on the left trying to no platform people on the right. Um, I mean, do you think that this is like a new phenomenon that we should be getting very concerned about? Well, um, another thing that I, I try to go back through history and find other examples where uh, contest, contestation happens about many types of monuments, artwork, all throughout history, all the way back to when, you know, uh, wars happen and people, other generations in those countries want to destroy other generations' artwork and monuments. I, I mean, I think that um, we can believe that it's happening more now, but it's just, uh, to me, a continuation. And I believe what's happening is more of a power struggle and that libraries are in the eye of the storm, which um, in some ways that reinforces how important we are though too um, in our culture and our society. And so, uh, so to your question, I don't believe it's something necessarily that is so new, even though it's framed like that, but that we always do have to be vigilant about this or our freedoms many of many varieties will be gone thank you thank you very very much i'm gonna move on to molly now but um if you have questions for adrian please do send them in um molly we were discussing earlier that more than nine out of ten elementary and middle school librarians have not bought a book recently because of the potential for controversy that was one finding from the School Library Journal in 2016's controversial book survey. Um, I would love to hear more about self-censorship. I mean, it seems like it's a massive issue. Do you find yourself kind of, do you find that you self-censor? Um, no, <laughs> no, I don't try to self-censor censor at all, but I, um, I've had experience when I was a public librarian, we would do summer reading visits and book talk, and inevitably there would always be some schools who would not let me talk about any books that had any sort of gay character, even if it was like a side character that was mentioned in one page. Somehow they found it and they would ask us not to speak about it. And um, that was one thing when I got into schools that I was really passionate about making sure that um, I didn't do that as well. I mean. At the public library, uh, we had selectors who selected our books. So, I mean, I wasn't making those hard decisions on what to buy and what would be appropriate for what age. So, um, Courtney already touched on this. Doing your research is a big thing. I mean, there are books that are not appropriate for certain age levels, but I mean, like the ones that uh, she dealt with challenges on are clearly children's books that belong in our elementary schools. But um, I've had some school librarian friends who are simply, they just don't buy them because they uh, just don't want to deal with it. And I don't think that they're like scared on such a level that Courtney's dealt with like that. Personally, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> when you were telling that story, Courtney. Um, I think sometimes they just don't want to deal with a parent complaining or going through the process of a challenged material. But um, we, can't, we have to do that. We have to um, go through the proper channels and we have to have those books for our students. I um, was doing book talks earlier this beginning of school year and I had a girl select a book and she was really excited. She told me, she was like, oh, this really represents my community. Um, 
the two main characters are gay in this book, and she was really excited about that, but then she said, but I have to be careful about which ones I take home, like this one you can't tell from the cover, um, because my parents are very homophobic, and she's dealing with that at home, so that broke my heart, but it just made me, like, get really, uh, start pulling out some of our books to make sure that there were some just, like, right there on display for her to select that, um, were a little more subtle that talked about the characters and things she wanted to hear about. So, I mean, it didn't take a student telling me that for me to always have those books in general, but um, a lot of librarians I hear too, they self-censor because they don't have those kids at their school. But um, fun fact, you do. They might just not talk to you because you're not being a safe person to them. And the school library should be a self safe and welcoming place. And um, there are reviews, there are blogs, there's a lot of really great resources if you just do your research um, to make sure you're selecting those books that are appropriate. I mean, there's some high school level books you shouldn't have in your elementary school, and that's fine. Um, but just, you know, read the reviews, do your research, um, take a book home and read it. Um, I had a friend who got us a, a grant to get some diverse books, and she purchased George, and I was really excited for her. And then uh, she was like, oh, one of my teachers is really upset. What's going on in this book? And I said, nothing. It's a perfectly acceptable um, elementary level book. I mean, we have it in my high school, but um, it's really great. It introduces this character. He's going through something that some kids might not know about or some of your kids might be going through. So um, I just personally, I, I'm on our intellectual freedom committee. So I really try to, when I hear those things about self-censorship, I try to say, hey, you know, you have a policy, you have intellectual freedom committee, you've got the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom. You have all of these resources at your fingertips to help you if you do get that angry parent or teacher or whatever. Um, hopefully you don't, but if you do, there's a lot of re resources that can help um, back you up. So please have those books. Don't don't be afraid or don't feel like, oh, you just want to go through the process. Like, it's not fun. I mean, Courtney has like a really intense story. So it's definitely cannot be, it's not fun. Um, but your kids deserve that so much. And, and it's not just, I mean, I personally, I've, most of the self-censorship has been about LGBTQ plus material, but there are other books too that, um, can be self-censored because you just think those kids don't exist or those stories don't need to be told. Um, but they need it. And just you have to remember that. Do you think that um, we, we're hearing about examples of books to do with mostly to, be, to do with LGBT people that have been censored? Um, and these stories are obviously all shocking. But do you think that they paint a picture of libraries getting more liberal and pushing more boundaries or less? Like, would it have been the case that, you know, 20, I know you haven't obviously, you're early on in your career on the whole, you haven't been in, working in the library system for that long, but do you think that we actually, we are making progress and that each time we fight these battles, we then hopefully are winning them so that the next generation doesn't have to fight them? I mean, I hope so. I think we are. Um, I mean, I'm just like right up, hopping a skip up the road from Courtney in Oklahoma, and I feel um, we have really good policy in my school district. I know if that were to come up, I would be really well supported. Um, but I think I don't know. It's hard. I think there's always going there are always going to be those uh, divisive opinions and people who just maybe don't understand and uh, then kind of come at you. But I hope it gets better. I mean, I think the most important part, I think, is when every time we have these challenges and we have these conversations that those um, students, those pe people, kids, whatever group you're working with, they see that you care and you care about their stories. And I think that's the most important thing. And I think as um, we show that how important they are and how much we care about them, that they'll help with the fight, too. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I think we're gonna open it up now to um, some audience questions. And I can see that we've already got a, through, a few through. Um, so I've got one that is gonna go to Courtney. Um, it is, without compromise, how can we plan to educate and reach out to more people and not end up in echo chambers? Hmm. Um. Well, know your community, first of all. Um, know what kind of people you have representing in your community. Um, I had a great friends group. Um, the library advisory board group was great. Um, 
there is a ton of help you can get, like Molly suggested. Um, I also served on the Intellectual Freedom for uh, Committee for Texas. Um, I'm serving as past president now, um, so that's helpful. Uh, ALA, OIF, I've had people, so many people reach out, NCAC, um, the ACLU actually came and helped us strategize a little bit um, to make sure that everything was um, not left out. We supported all the groups uh, that were being uh, not supported. Uh, comic Book Legal Defense also, uh, we reached out to them and they reached back out to us. Um, and even the National Council of Teachers of English, NCTE, they were very helpful as well. And so you just have to get a good community of support around you for that. Great, thank you. And uh, just a, another question. Um, uh, we have had a few questions about whether you did anticipate, you also, I'm assuming you didn't anticipate the pushback that you had, but did you anticipate some pushback when you did, when you ordered those books? Um, I didn't actually order those. The children's librarian ordered them. Um, and uh, she was getting a lot of heat as well. Uh, so I kind of re removed her. I'm like a big mama bear. I re removed her from the situation as much as possible and took that heat on myself. Um, but I supported her 110% on her purchases. And um, I mean, we had a Christian fiction collection for adult fiction. We, we had Mein Kampf, we have the Bible. I showed everyone that was against the books, how we know our community. We, we, we buy more um, conservative type books than liberal type books. Um, we, so, um, and I told them I would be at the bat if someone was against the Bible, which is a very challenged book. So um, that's just, I don't know, that's that's what you do. But, but Courtney, could I, in regard to compromise, um, earlier you mentioned that uh, you did move, try moving the book to a different section and that didn't quell the controversy at all. It just continued. No, it just continued. So, so their ultimate goal was to, by, I guess I'm just saying, what is a compromise? Because actually what they wanted was a removal of them entirely. Right. That's what they wanted. Um, but they knew that there were repercussions if the court decided to remove the books totally from the collection based on the legal actions that have happened with PICO and another one. Um, so they would walk that back rather quickly, like, oh, we're not we're not asking to remove the books or burn the books when actually two said to burn them. Um, we're just wanting to move it out of the children's area. And so when I did do that, it, it didn't it didn't stop. Um, they they wanted the books removed from the collection. I guess I'm, I, I'm just pointing out that compromise um, isn't really compromise if that's what they really wanted. And we're right. pushing that. Yeah, yeah. I still regret that. Never compromise. Stand your ground. I have a question from the audience for Adrian. It's kind of moving on to the slightly bigger theme. Um, what what would be your thoughts on the removal of Confederate statues? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I did think about that quite heavily because, to me, it did feel different. Um, and I know these are very complex and difficult issues, but according to my knowledge about the research I've done and the reading I've done about the Confederate statues, they were built, they weren't um, historic to the time. They were um, erected later and had other political reasons to be created and erected. Whereas these um, murals, were original to the uh, building itself and were commissioned as part of the building. Um, I have to admit that if the murals were anywhere else other than in the library, I may not even have, um, I have to admit, cared as much about something happening to them. But because they were part of our historic library, at the time and original to that design and to the building, I felt that we could 
use the, the murals for education and dialogue and uh, still have the conservation of them uh, as part of what we were doing in the libraries, which was conserving and preserving history of the institution and so forth. So I did think about that. And I, uh, so while I could understand removal of say Confederate statues that were done uh, in, in later and for other political reasons, these just didn't feel the same. Um, some people brought up shrouding them, including the administration there. And again, because it was in a library, I felt that shrouding them was not the answer either because it was too akin to censorship in my view. So I don't know if that satisfies that question, but that is the thought process that I went through. Thank you As, very much. Uh, could I also say that the university had buildings that were named after what later it became clear uh, they were figures at, on the campus that were, belonged to the KKK. And in those instances where the, the monuments, monumental names were honoring people who we now know were part of that hateful and violent movement, I could personally and professionally see a difference too between wanting those buildings to be denamed, for example, versus these original artworks that were on our uh, embedded on our walls. So I don't know if that helps, but that was a thought process I went through. Thank you. Um, I've got a question now from Molly. Um, we've been asked, it seems the parents who have post certain books feel those books are inappropriate. Who decides what is appropriate? And what do you do to show these people or groups you can be trusted with those decisions? So a lot of times I know they take things out of context or like there's a book with a gay character in it. And so that's in a, that's inappropriate for that family. But um, with our policies, we select books for all students. And if they don't want their child reading that, then that's a conversation with their child. But um, we're going to have those books for all students. And so, I mean, yeah, we have Mein Kampf in, in our library, too. We have a lot of different things, a lot of different viewpoints and backgrounds. And so I think just uh, having a good collection development policy where that is very um, clear and spelled out um, is helpful when you just at least have a parent who's a little like um, concerned before they met. I mean, we have, sometimes we've had parents that have just been concerned about things without going all the way. They just kind of have to hear that like, we're going to have this, we have this book, we have all of these books, um, well, let's find your kid something different. Um, but I mean, I think like for appropriateness, like especially like between like elementary, middle school and high school um, with like school library journals, a great one. They give you grade level or age level recommendations. So um, definitely in our policy um, is for my district, especially we have to have uh, reviews that help support which what age group um, something should fall in. So those um, professional journals and um, backup stuff like that. Um, also help us make those decisions and we can explain that to anyone who might be concerned. I've got a question, I've got actually two questions. One is from myself and one is from an audience member that I just want to throw out to you all to have a think about and maybe uh, you um, come in. So the audience member question is how can we make individuals, particularly fanatics, and understand that books can transform lives? And my question, which I guess slightly relates to this as well, is how can we make actually banned books, controversial books, like how can we use them to frame constructive conversations? Um, maybe, Courtney, do you want to answer some of that? Um, it's <laughs> It would be difficult where I was to do that. Uh, most of the time I would say, why don't you just read the book and see what you say for yourself? And <laughs> they did read the book and that wasn't helpful um, because they saw it, this, this one-sided way far out there view of it. Um, but I just wish people were more um, empathetic, understanding, um, want to reach across that aisle uh, as it were and um, find people that are different from them and, and just, talk um 
just talk about your differences and we've lost civility with that. And um, I wish we could have it back. I wish we could have done that. I was hoping I could be that person that could kind of mend that county. And so everyone would, you know, hear each other's side and, and be welcoming and inclusive and nice. Um, but it didn't work. Um, so it, it's it's really difficult if you are in a community like I was in. Um, but that that's my wish that it could have happened like that. Um, I've got a question for Adrian um, from an audience member. Um, what are your thoughts on removing books for young children that are problematic in depicting race inappropriately? Uh, I'm sorry, removing books from young children? What are my removing books for young children? So I guess I guess the kind of the question here would be if a book is problematic in its depiction of race. Mm -hmm. is uh, if it's to young kids is this a kind of do uh, when they're so young and vulnerable to new information would you have a problem with removing it or not i suppose it's the question well I, no i i pretty much am so if the question is related to whether i'm absolutist in regard to intellectual freedom meaning in all circumstances. You know, I can think, I, I understand the, the uh, underlying question. Yeah, um, that's what I think. I, I have to say that I tend to be a bit, <laughs> not, I wouldn't say absolutist, but tend more to that because it is so important to the ability of any human being to be able to make up their own minds, see different points of view, and be able to, you know, uh, address that in their own thinking and coming to some sort of conclusion about any topic or issue. Now, if the question is, what if someone is so young that the works may affect them in, uh, disproportionately or something? You know, I, I still tend to say that a library should have these available and then if I had to, now I'm not a, a, a youth librarian or, you know, and I actually have never worked in a public library, but I would hope that there are other aspects of that youth or, or that young person's life that will help them understand and uh, be educated about the issues that they're reading. So I don't know if that helps, but, um, I know these are complex issues. It's just that um, I would prefer to say that libraries should not be censoring materials, that it should be more on the part of whatever that family is or that person. They don't have to read the materials if, if they object to them. Thank you. Um, I've got another, uh, this is gonna be the final audience question. Um, thank you so much for all sending them in. Um, and I'm going to direct this one at Molly, given her background. Um, have you found it helpful to have links to the intellectual freedom policies online or promoted? If so, what works best? What from your work with Intellectual Freedom Committee, what do you think works best? So like currently we're trying to update our handbook. So I've just been knee deep in the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom Policies and Toolkit. So um, I will say there's a lot there. So I can see like if you um, like have a challenge right away, it can be really overwhelming. Um, I actually, when we were going through our handbook, I reached out to a librarian who had had a challenge a few years back and I asked her like, what would be the most helpful? And she mentioned that um, just having kind of just a little like quick step-by-step -step what to do first in that instant um, is the most helpful. So like, what do you do when that parent comes up to you and has an objection to this book? And then, you know, just kind of have it at least, cause that's a very like heated moment, um, but at least having a little checklist of like, explain the collection development policy, like don't, uh, give in to them but at least explain where you're coming from and what the library's perspective is and um, just a nice little checklist which um, they do have some so if your state 
committee doesn't have a handbook or have that readily available, just having your own, just kind of little checklist ready to go um, would be the most helpful. And definitely I would recommend like doing your research ahead of time and having that prepared so that you're not caught off guard um, when that, because I mean, we're talking about, we've been talking about certain books that have been challenged, but honestly, anything in your library could be challenged. Like you're, someone could just be like, there's the A word in this book randomly and I hate it now. So um, just having a, a little go-to, which uh, your state association should have, or at least ALA definitely has, or even if you just have to kind of write it out yourself, kind of what your process would be based on the support and help you have. Thank you. Well, we've got just a few minutes left, and I thought for the last few minutes to tie in with the title of this webinar, I thought each of the speakers could say between one to three tips that they would give us the kind of the really take home tips of what to do in a library when someone is trying to ban a book. So let's do Courtney, then Adrian, then Molly. Okay. Um, number one, policies. Um, make sure your policies are up to date um, and it has a clear procedure on how to handle a challenge. That's one of the things that I struggled with because the previous director didn't get it passed by the commissioner's court. So we were kind of stuck in a limbo. Make sure you have your policies. Make sure you understand your policies. Make sure your staff understands how to deal with the challenge. Because most likely if you're a director or assistant director or a supervisor, um, and sometimes if your frontline staff doesn't know how to handle it, it could it could really go badly quickly. Um, so make sure your whole staff understand how to do the procedures for a challenge book. Um, use the Intellectual Freedom Manual. Um, ALA has a great manual. They have a ninth edition. I think the 10th edition is out soon. Um, use ALA OIF or your state Intellectual Freedom Committee. They can be very helpful um, because people like Molly and I serve on them and have been through challenges and so we can help you. Um, and don't self-censor, which Molly uh, touched on this as well. Um, a lot of librarians purchase books and choose not to purchase books because they're scared of what would happen. Um, like the actress, I forgot her name, but she's served on or she is on the Miss Maisel TV show, Step Out of Line, do it. Buy a book and don't be scared about what happens. If that book needs to be in your collection for your community, buy that book for them. Great. And Adrian, what would be your one takeaway? Well, um, Courtney, you just listed many of my um, strategies also that I would say. Um, policies and procedures, so good. Uh, support and assistance from ALA and other groups. And then engaging with the community in a proactive way in advance about the importance of intellectual freedom. These are all things that I would do. But I wanted to add one more, and I was inspired to add it when I heard Courtney's story a little bit more in depth. And that is, let's all support the Merit Fund, uh, which is there to support um, librarians and others who are struggling through these censorship type of battles. Great, thank you, the Merit Fund. So definitely one to look out for. Um, and Molly, tell us your thoughts. Um, so my big, big one that hasn't already been uh, spoken about would be to really in your library create this culture of the freedom to read. Don't just wait until BAM Books Week to have a cute, super awesome display and have those conversations just that one week. Do it all the time. Um, like for school librarians, I mean, if you're working with your government classes or any of your social studies classes and you're talking about that First Amendment, what a great way to bring in uh, BAM Books Week and our about banned and challenged books and how we have the freedom to read and the freedom to access of information. Um, there's lots of different like uh, subjects that you could pull that in when you're just um, teaching lessons and things, um, but also just making sure those books are in your collection to from day one and uh, just really creating this culture, especially that and it's not just like banned books. Ah, that's awful. Just like, hey, we all have the right to read what we want, to hear these stories, to be a part of something bigger um, and do that all year long. Great. Brilliant point to end on. Um, very inspiring. So let's all continue to promote banned books, to talk about banned books, promote all different kinds of books. Um, 
so at the beginning of Banff Books Week, we have there are loads of great things going on in the USA and the UK. And sadly, that is all we have time for today um, on this webinar. But thank you everyone for joining and thank you to these three great speakers. In the coming weeks, please be on the lookout for the recording of the webinar in case you miss certain bits. Um, thank you all for listening and have good Mondays. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.